Welcome to the Oh So Spurs podcast. If you're looking for Ange out and no plan B or pure bedwetting, this isn't the place for you. We're going to be giving you a healthy dose of fizzy tonic, a dose of reason and sanity amongst madness and hysteria. And to help me with all of that today, we have a guest in Ross, who you may know as Tottenham Simpsons on Twitter. How are you, Ross? Yeah, I'm all right now. I was really depressed yesterday. God, I was just, and not because of the result. <laughs> It was just the fans, but we'll get on to that in a bit later. Apart from that, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me on. Great to have you on. We have Stu in sunny Dubai, COVID-ridden. How are you? I'm all right. I'm not sure what's um, knocked me for six more, the loss in the derby or the COVID, but um, <laughs> yeah, not a great combo. <laughs> and we have Johnny. How are you, mate? Give us a, I'm great. Can someone give me a, I'm really good? Because I'm really good. So come on, Johnny. <laughs> Join me. <laughs> okay, I'll take it. Okay. And Sai, come on, mate. Help me out here. Yeah, I'm all right today. I've got to say the journey home from the ground to Liverpool Street on the Elizabeth line to Heathrow, back to Basel, getting it midnight. That wasn't a great journey. But it's all right today. No. It's all right today, isn't it? A good night's sleep does us a world of good. Um, and could I always just welcome our three first members, which we launched in the middle of the week, in Vaz, the Spurs guy. Good Not job, Vaz. Vaz. We've got Sweet. Jelly Bean and we've got Richard. Biggest. So your comments will be getting full priority as we move through the show today. I'm keeping coming in and we will do some better badges for you. At the moment, they're the generic Sweet. YouTube ones. We'll get some Michael Dawson, Ledley King ones, all that kind of stuff. So don't worry, we've got some better stuff coming and some watch along content for our members. If you're interested in doing that, you can sign up as well. Um, yeah, it's easy to do on YouTube if you're just watching on YouTube. Anyway, we've got some great questions that have come in. And they're pretty reasonable ones, which I'm very excited to, to discuss with you all today, guys. But also some general points about performance I'd like to start with and ask around the room. Johnny, I'll start with you this time, mate. Okay. There's been a lot of... Uh, okay, I'm kind of leading to an answer I hope you're going to give me here. It's just a really biased way of doing it. But a lot of the criticism, once again, was there's no plan B. But yeah. I thought that was a very different and approach to a football game versus what we were doing last season. It felt... Like we were playing conservative, wing backs weren't bombing forward like they were. It was like mm. we knew going gun ho would result in a defeat. So Ange scaled things back and changed things. Did you see it differently? Was there a change in the performance? Was there improvements defensively? Or am I imagining all this? No, I think I definitely agree. But I, 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 that's I definitely agree with that. The way we set up and that clearly what happened last year with being three 0 down at half time, like that was so catastrophic. And I think that he, that. As a result of that, things were a bit more tempered. But at the same time, I do think that the way that Arsenal have adjusted to their personnel issues also kind of made it a bit easier for us to be less vulnerable, I guess, than we might have been if they're at full strength. I mean, I think the whole thing about them being minus key players, okay, they're very important players, has been massively over And And um, that would have been the first excuse, obviously, if things hadn't gone Arteta's way but because it did we're, we're not hearing that so much I don't I, th I, I I'm disappointed in how we played I think when you look at um, depending on what length of highlights you watch you get a different take as, as with any game I sort of came away being very frustrated and a couple of individuals that really annoyed me the most from our team and I was really disappointed with how we didn't respond after we went down I was really disappointed that certain substitutions weren't made earlier. I do think that we have to be honest and, you know, open to seeing things that we aren't very happy with. As with what Ross was alluding to in the introductions, like the the level of overreaction. I'm sorry, I know it's Arsenal. I hurt as much and I'm hurting as much as anybody else. I know it's Arsenal. Again, it's really horrible to take three defeats in a row at home. Talking about Ange's position at this stage is absolutely outrageous. And I'm really actually quite angry about it. I think people who are freely discussing that need their heads read. And I don't know what they are doing personally. I'm very, very angry about it. And just going back in terms of the game, the last thing I said is I actually think if you watch Match of the Day 2, which I did about an hour ago, um, and I know it's highlights, but we, we did a lot more than I thought <laughs> I remember when I was actually watching the game. Like, the first 15, 20 minutes, we were really good. Okay, there were certain, like, decisions that we could have made that were 
would have been a bit better, play with a little bit more confidence. But like, yeah, you know, I don't think that Arsenal had to do anything other than just have one brilliant, like really good, well, well worked out corner. And sorry, I know I'm kind of going all in different directions here, but yeah, I didn't think it was anywhere near as bad as this whole reaction is now. You and- know. Johnny, you're going to give us some context later around. And I, I'll pause you there because I don't want you to get to the good, the really good yeah, that sorry. I really like. You've got some really good information around how Ange compares to Arteta's mm. and Klopp's tenures when they joined. And I know everyone's heard that narrative, but there's some specific data around that Johnny's got and information about that that I think is really interesting. And we're going to part that. We're going to come back to that. And si has got some great stuff as well. And I want to come back to you in a second, Si, on that. But first, um, Stu and Ross had a question each each for you guys. Stu, your view is that, Johnny alluded to it there, but there was like the whole kind of, we lost to Arsenal. I get it. It's a North London derby. Like it's the biggest, it's one of the only derbies in the Premier League, like a proper derby, you know, location, a true derby. It's not just a rivalry. To lose to them is the worst in the world. But I, I, there's two stats going around that really bug me. I keep seeing we've lost three derbies in a row. That's unacceptable. But that completely misses out the fact that for the first time in 20 years, Arsenal have been outstanding for the last three years. Like they've been the second best team in the league bar Man City for three years. So it's not surprising that the second, when Arsenal are that good, they're beating us. When they were sixth, seventh and eighth, they weren't, when they're sixth, eighth and eighth, they weren't beating us. Like, is it, was the import, did the points really go that badly or is there context and other reasons why we lost? Did you see it, some positives in there? I, I think there's, as soon as they scored, there was a lot of revisionist history of how the game was going, in my opinion. It wasn't a game where they dominated. I mean, last season, to be honest, I, I think the 3-0 at halftime flattered them, and we came back really well, and we could have got an equaliser. But we weren't outplayed today. We dominated the ball. If you look at XG, depending on which one you look at, it's either 0.81 to 0.86 or 0.71 to 0.74 or something like that. Yeah. The XG was the same. They got a goal from a set piece, which is why everyone is losing their sh- because they're going out of last season or set pieces, etc. This is the first set piece we've conceded this season, and it came from a clear two-handed shove in the back of Romero. So... Whether Romero should have done better or not is another discussion we'll get into later, but it was a foul. And because of that, everyone was going on about how Arsenal had it easy, they didn't get out of second gear. I'm sorry, that's absolute nonsense. nonsense. Yeah, that's cool. It's that's absolute cool. nonsense. It wasn't yeah. that bad. If Solanke had basically had a better first touch in that first half and we you know the, the you know the closing down was doing really well and got that shot off got a goal in if johnson had been able to keep the ball down we had chances to score we just got punished but it wasn't the disaster i don't think that it is but of course because it was a set piece vicario is the worst goalkeeper in the world uh and doesn't got a clue and we've not learned anything from last season the fact that the stats disprove that is neither here nor there apparently and ross do you been you know, really feeling that because you're quite prevalent on, you know, Twitter, like I am as well, because you've got a you've got a popular account on there. So you're naturally going to gravitate on there. But you have seen a lot of this extreme sides to the fan base where we're seeing uh, we've called it crazy. Already. And I'm sorry if you are one of those people, I am going to call you absolutely crazy for wanting to hit the reset button and abandon Ange Postacoglu already. Ross, is this is there any sense in that view that we rip off the Band-Aid, just get rid of Ange and bring in, I don't know, Thomas Tuchel? Or is it just, do we just put our hands in our ears and just ignore it all? Yeah, let's let's get Thomas Tuchel last two seasons and then go. No, there isn't. We're suffering, and I, we talked about this yesterday a little bit, and I've mentioned this before. We've had, a, I would say, a five-year cycle since Amsterdam where... Poch never rejuvenated the team properly. Jose and Antonio Conte, they just kind of, they're not Tottenham managers and they never would have been. I tried to back them as much as you can, but in between Nuno, who just kind of came and went, and we all forget about poor Nuno. And what's happened now, Ange's picking up a lot of, had to pick up a lot of Deadwood. The fact that we got rid of so many players in the summer, it was exceptional, I thought. Did we get enough in? Probably not, but... Third window, and Sorry. we've got plenty in, just not enough at the moment. But that will come. But no, to get yeah. rid of Ange is... A, that's the most stupidest thing I've heard. And I saw Fabrizio Romano tweet earlier about it. It's such a non-story. I mean, I know he's bored because it's not 
transfer season. But come on, it's just they're not going to sack Ange. He's got he's going to build something. Just let him bloody build for God's sake. But mm-hmm. yeah, and I agree with the other guys. It's no point in just tearing us up. He's got some good youngsters coming through for the first time in. God knows how long. I mean, somebody might be able to point me in the right direction. We've got some great talent in the academy, and they're getting a oh. sniff. They probably should have brought on Bergval and Archie Gray, but hindsight, when we're all millionaires, just calm down. It's really horrible losing to that lot. A, because they're not a nice side. They're not a, a side that... I've got a few friends that support, like Palace and all that. They don't like Arsenal because they just come across as absolute whoppers. So they're not, mm. but they don't, they're not there to make friends. And Arteta's got a very punchable face anyway. But all this narrative around getting rid of Ange is just utter crap, I'm afraid. It's really, really just knee jerk reaction gone bad. Yeah. There's, you touched on it there, Ross. There's a element of the ghosts of Conte, Nuno, Stellini, and Mason times two shadow over Ange because us fans have been told, be patient. And, and if you're listening as a fan who follows Ange, maybe not, you know, Spurs, and you've entered the journey with us at a later stage, what's essentially happened is we've, in the last decade, had, you know, we, had, we went through a time with Pochettino where we got so close. We flew close to the sun, we came second, we got to a Champions League final. We wanted to stay there. That's where we felt we then belonged. We'd finally broken the ceiling and entered that level that Chelsea play with and City play with. And we weren't mucking around scrapping for fourth, even though that's still quite a strong position to be in. And then we made just bad appointment after bad appointment. Jose, we tried to, was just toxic to the club, didn't respect us, called out fans, Conte, Stellini, Mason had to be do an interim job, all this stuff. And every time everyone would say, be patient, give it a few years, be patient, be patient, be patient. But Andrew's completely different. He's got a DNA that suits the club. And he's the one out of all those guys that deserves the patience. But because we've been told to be patient with them, some of our fans, I don't think, can hold their bladders any longer and they're just wetting themselves every time something goes wrong on the journey. And it is, and I can see why they're hurting, but they need to just accept that resetting makes it 10 times worse. We've got to stick with Ange. Sai has got some super interesting knowledge bombs for us now, Sai. Um, you want to talk about the context of fourth seasons and why that might be the magic yeah. number? Yeah, and we'll let the viewers be the... Uh... Be the judge of the interest, I guess. But um, when I was looking at, I was again like like all of us. You saw X blow up last night, and all the feeds are going all toxic again, and blah 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 blah. And I thought to myself, well, let let me remind myself about the journey that Arsenal went on with Lego Head. Let me remind myself the journey that the Bin Dippers went on with Klopp. And it's not until the fourth season that you really see a step change in points accumulation. So with Arsenal, we all know the positions, 8th, 8th, 5th, 2nd, right? And that's fine if you define you define improvement by position, which Ange definitely doesn't, and I don't think you should. You should define points by your improve. You should define success by the improvement in points every season, which Arsenal have done for the last five seasons. Season four, they jumped 25 points. That's when the team really gelled. And Liverpool jumped 22 points in the fourth season. So it takes time. To Russ's point, look how much we've had to clear out to get in. And you don't do that. Basically, it's uh, it's three transfer windows, as Russ alluded to. And you don't rebuild a team in three transfer windows. You just don't. I mean, you've got to give it time. You've got to get behind the manager in terms of the playing style that we've got, I think we are improving on last year. If you look at the uh, if you look at the the Arsenal game last year and the Newcastle game last year for for examples, I think you know both of those are improvements. For large parts of the game today, we controlled it. Now I will concede to a certain extent that not that Arsenal let us control it, but they weren't that interested in coming out and playing openly and expansively for us mm. to to, mm. to exploit. But then again, we didn't yeah. open them up. We should have gone wider. We should have been a bit more brave going around the outside. But even when we did, we couldn't cross the ball for some reason. I don't know what was going on today. It was uh, the final. The fight. The defense today wasn't the problem. The final third was the problem. Mm. You know, the defending the set pieces wasn't the problem. You know, it was the decision making in the final third. And let's be really clear: we're up against probably the best defensive unit in Europe, maybe. 
right there. And if they decide they want to defend and they decide they want to be deep and narrow, they're going to be deep and narrow. And we struggle to undo teams that aren't very good at deep and narrow defending, let alone a team that is absolutely on the ball. Um, we'll go into it a, bit, a little bit later, but I thought we could have done more to expose Timber down that right-hand side. First game back after a long injury, right-footed, playing left-back. I think there was a little bit more that we could have mm. done that, that right-hand side. But, yeah, to come back to your point, Jim, because I went off at a major tangent, almost perpendicular rather than a tangent, season four is where you see the teams that stick with it. That's where you see them really kick on with the points accumulation. We we either reset every year, get nowhere, or you know we stick with it and uh, with Andy's time because I think did Klopp and Arteta both come in part way through seasons? Yeah, I yes. think they did, didn't they? So it's their third full season that they kicked on with the points, and that's what we'd expect, right? I think we're on, if you're watching on the YouTube, on you can see us all nodding. There's like this. Everyone when Andy sat and signed up, I swear, was going got to give this guy at least three years. We know there's going to be painful. And there's that famous, it's the view from the lane thing, isn't it? That when Charlie Eccleshare or whoever it was, might be Jack, but one of you guys said, just prepare for the constant, but you can't get away playing like that in the Premier League. It's the Premier League. <laughs> oh God, you got to, you can't win like that. It's the Premier League. It's not imagining Celtic in the SPL. And that has been a repetitive, boring narrative. And it's so stupid as well in so many you can you can debunk that so quickly because how many times under Jose did we stop being like that in the Premier League put 11 men behind the ball for the last five minutes and concede over and over and over and over again when we probably would have won if we kept attacking like I get there's a middle ground and you need to be good at doing both but Ange does so pragmatism and retracts the intensity and he has played different formations so it does exist but anyway Johnny you had some Pretty interesting quotes and yeah. article headlines from when Arteta was in his process, shall we call it? As with everybody, like I was just so frustrated by the whole narrative with anyone wanting to bring up Ange's position. And I thought, okay, rather than us keep saying, you know, it took four years for Klopp to win the Champions League, so let's go into the actual moments where specific situations. And I just sort of had a look at where Arsenal were a year after Arteta came to the job. So and just basically a year into the job at Tottenham. So it's pretty fair, I think, to put the two against each other. So the so we're talking about December twenty twenty. And the first headline, this is for following a one nil defeat to Burnley um at the Emirates. I think it was at the Emirates, yeah. Um on the thirteenth of December. And the headline here, this is this is in The Guardian. Yeah. And it's good. The headline is Arsenal in crisis. How low can they go? Quotation. This is the first time Arsenal have, sorry, the Gunners were beaten 1-0 by Burnley on Sunday night, thanks in large part to Saka sending off for grabbing Westwood by the throat. Meaning Arteta's side have just 13 points. 13 points from 12 games. This is the first time Arsenal have lost four in a row at home since 1959. It was Burnley's first top flight win over Arsenal since 1974. And Arsenal's 10 goals from 12 Premier League games is their lowest return since 1981. I mean, like, talk about records. A truly record-breaking season for all the wrong reasons so far at Arsenal. And the next thing... It sounds a bit familiar. Actually, yeah, it does sound familiar, doesn't it? That's the ne next one. That was actually from that was actually from forty two dot e, which is a really top Irish. It's probably maybe said elsewhere as well. So the second one is, um, and yeah, I think this this is sorry. So but that but that was the middle of December. The ne next game came along, and they were playing. I think it was Everton. So on the nineteenth of December. So so basically a week later, a headline in the forty two dot e. The first one was Sky Sports. Sorry, this one, uh, headline. Arteta, Arsenal's run of results not acceptable. Arsenal manager Mikel Arteta admits their current run of results are unacceptable and do not meet the high standards the club has set, but maintains they've been unlucky during a seven-match winless run. The 2-1 reverse at Everton was their fifth defeat in that six sequence and has resulted in their worst points return, 14 from 14 matches, since 1974-75. They've lost eight times in total, and only bottom side Sheffield United have a worse record, and it's put Arteta, who marks his one-year anniversary at the club on Sunday, under pressure. 
and then Arteta says, we have to improve, but as we, as well, I think we have been very unlucky not to pick up any more points. That's the last piece I'm going to quote. This is The Guardian, and this is on Christmas Day 2020. So this is what Mikel was eating or reading. Maybe he was eating it as well. Uh, as he was sort of choking on his turkey sandwich uh, for Christmas Day. Headline in The Guardian, Mikel, this is, this. Gen- I'm not making this up, way, okay? You, you can search it. No, Mikel believe you. Arteta... Mikel Arteta says relegation fight looms if Arsenal fail in next three matches. Mikel Arteta has admitted to feeling the psychological strain of Arsenal's dire predicament and accepts the next three matches will determine whether the club are dragged into a relegation battle. Arsenal are 15th in the Premier League after taking five points from their past 10 games. Following the Boxing Day visit of Chelsea, they go to Brighton on Tuesday in West Brom on next Saturday. The team's currently blah, blah, blah. And then the last thing, uh, yeah, he's going on about all the things that they need to do and keep believing and how much energy is and all the weight they're under, all the pressure they're under. But it's like, I think that just browsing, I I looked at Liverpool as well, but I've got juicier quotes and I I enjoyed looking into the Arsenal situation more for obvious reasons. I can't believe Johnny and Mikel Arteta have made me feel better. What a comeback. Jim, just let me, as Johnny was, was reading out those from sort of like respected, um, yeah, you, you know, media outlets, I've just been having a flick through AFTV, which is, uh, it really is quite interesting. When we, <laughs> put, when we beat them 2-0 two, two uh, a couple of years ago at home, troops, I've had enough, Arteta out. Yeah, yeah. when uh, Lee had a rant, Arteta has failed, get him out. It's like... Yeah. You know, if we think some of our fan base is toxic, I, I mean, I I used to subscribe to that just for the shits and giggles. Oh, really? it, was, it was hilarious. The season they finished fifth, didn't they lose like the first three games of the season or something yes. like that as well? They lost to yeah. Brentford in the first yeah. game, I remember. Yeah. yeah did they did. You say five points from 10 games or 10 points. Five points from 10 games. If we did that, can you. People can't stomach like. What are we on? What is it? Four points for four games, four and everyone's points. having a. F- it's just, jeez. I, mean, I think we're going to have to clip those clips <laughs> and put them on the internet after this. Yeah. Um, although I, I did a tweet the other day, right? Last just a few days ago, on my personal profile, thinking I better start using this now. It's at Jim Oso Spurs, um, give us a follow. <laughs> it got one point two million views and twenty thousand likes. I got two followers. Two and I and it only actually is one because one person unfollowed me for it and two followed me. Outrageous. Anyway, so at GMO Spurs, love to see you there, guys. We've got loads of great questions to come in. And Stu, I, I I wanted to to kick you off with uh, Faz the Spurs guy, and then Ross. It will be your turn because there's some of your followers as well, Brittany and Ross. Um, I'd love to love to pass. And there's a few Simpson specific ones. But Vaz, actually, a really good one here, Stu. If you f- want to explain this one, as an Aussie, we have sporting rivalry here. But it seems another level with Arsenal versus Spurs. I will never understand wanting to lose against City last year. Can you please explain to me what the rivalry feels like for someone who legitimately can't experience it? Is there a genuine hatred or is this just banter? Well, it's not banter, but Stu. (laughs) As someone who is told I'm not allowed to have an opinion because I'm not from London, probably you or Sai should answer that question. Okay. (laughs) Sai, I'll go on, mate. Do you want to start? Yeah, genuine hatred, mate. Um, we were talking yesterday about, you know, I I hate it, the North London derby. I love it. I hate it. I can't. The morning, it's anxiousness. It's nervousness. It's I, I'm a, I, I can't watch. And just the tension. And then coming home yesterday after losing, it's just like, just, oh. Yeah. No, I can't stand them. They're just right. wrong. Just wrong. Ross? They shouldn't even be there either, should they? Come on. They shouldn't. Well, I'm going to... Yeah, I do want to explain the actual history, but Ross, I want yeah. your emotion here as well. Do you, Is it just banter or is it blind hatred? It's beyond hatred. Um, <laughs> I was speaking to someone the other day, actually, and they said that they hated West Ham more. It's cunt. No, it's, it's no. them. They no. moved over from the south of... Didn't they move from Woolwich, Woolwich. didn't they? Woolwich. That's why they yeah. called knocked Arsenal, us. the Woolwich Arsenal. Yeah. Exactly, and they knocked us out of the Football League, didn't they? Yeah. Because they paid of some to get sort... in above us. They yeah. paid yeah. to get yeah. in above us. After the war. Yeah. 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 So, just... I don't know. Just something about them at the minute just made them... Makes them worse, and... Even Arteta's trousers piss me off. I really do annoy me. I don't know why. 
There's just something about his bloody trousers that annoy him. And he's prancing around. Stay in your box, you... Anyway. Gets away at that. Mad. I just can't stand him. And I can't stand <laughs> his players. And they didn't have Rice and bloody Odegaard yesterday and we still lost. But, oh well. Mm. Oh well. I just... <laughs> For some context there, for maybe if you're not aware of the history of Arsenal, the, the long story short, there's some further back history, like Sai was touching on there, about them paying to get ahead of us in the league. And there is that's genuinely a situation. But basically, they were not next door to us. They were in Woolwich. And then they built a new stadium and the location they chose was down the road from Spurs. So <clears throat> we were pretty much the only real, true powerhouse of football in North London. Arsenal come in and let's face it, guys, they they were probably a bit better at football than us. So they did kind of come in there and then start winning trophies. And it caused, obviously, we're next door to each other. We're still two huge clubs who hate each other next door. They've moved into our area. There's rumours that the white on their sleeves is an acknowledgement towards us. Um, and I'm going to live and die by that being a fact, even though it's not proven. But uh, yeah, then what happened was what made things even more spicy was we had a club captain and legend called Sol Campbell, and he was like our best centre-back to ever come through our academy. Like, amazing, amazing player, captain the side. His contract was coming to an expiry date, and he said, don't worry, lads, you'll wake up in the morning and I'll have, I'll have signed the extension, can't wait. All in the media, just wait, waiting to wake up to that news, and we woke up to the news. He'd signed for Arsenal on a free transfer, and he could have gone anywhere at that point, but he chose them. Um, so that added a lot more bitterness to it as well. There's been multiple occasions where they've just cheated to get in certain positions. Like during COVID, they literally, they managed to cheat their way out of our derby game when they were missing a couple of players with COVID because they were scared of playing us because we were better than them at that point to get it postponed to a time of weird worse fixtures. They're just, they're just, in, they're just horrible, insufferable. And they also, technically the history of them, by the way, they were building, um, they used to build weapons for other countries at, at war that's why they built the cannons on there apparently so if you want to be really bitter and go back really really far you could say you are the you contributed to the murder of thousands of people you filthy filthy dirty yeah this it's a real hatred but Stu, did you want to say something there no so they, they, they had one person who had covid and they managed to get the book game postponed it was absolutely it was called off the day before i was mm. i was going to that game and i was in dublin at a hockey match refreshing all the time to see if there's any bloody news it was like called off the afternoon on the saturday afternoon the game was on mm. sunday but in the end it ended up better didn't it we got three yeah. nil may uh that was that was the best night ever yeah they also um famously have and you've only really just following now it's changed a little bit but they had the worst atmosphere ever like on any premier league side yeah. highbury the library they were very like corporate and ungenuine yeah. like their fan base so spurs and the other football clubs even west ham to be fair to them you'll find it's like everyone there loves the club live and die it's by it working class isn't but it but arsenal are more concerned about very... being seen in a 150 quid nike shirt and having all the gear and like yeah. you know i'll turn up when we're doing well but when they were doing badly their stadium was like 30 percent down on attendance because the fans just don't stick with them through the thin. They're but, scum. But also, they were known for boring football. It was the 1-0 the yeah. to the Arsenal. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah. But let's not waste too much time on them, um, because we've got 18 questions and not that much <laughs> time to get through that. Really. Myers has said, so we're starting with YouTube, we have got the Twitter questions as well, if you're listening on, on the audio. Um, Myers says, does the new squad simply need more time together to get results against upper-level teams? Yeah, I think... Um... A key factor was this was Solanke's first game back since his injury. He'd only played, what, 90 minutes of which half of it was hobbled beforehand with that team. So obviously he's still getting used to the to the side. I think, you know, as, as Ross mentioned before, you know, we have moved on a lot of players. So yes, our starting 11 was just pretty much similar to what we had last year, but our bench is a whole bunch of new players that we've got to be integrated into the side. So I think it, it's going to take time. Um, and I think... As a fan base, it's important for us to get behind the players as they get used to the speed and get up to – they're going to make mistakes. We bought young players. Young players need time to grow into the roles. Arsenal players that we were talking about with, with Johnny before, the whole thing with Arteta was he got rid of the old guard and brought in a whole bunch of young players, and they made mistakes, yeah. and they went through growing pains, losing terrible games to Burnley and Everton and the likes. Yeah. And that's going to happen to us, and we've got to stick behind them. Brennan Johnson, you know, we'll get into probably later. He, he disappointed me yesterday, but 
getting on his back is not going to help. So let's get behind it, give them time, and you'll start to see, I'm sure, the mechanisms of when Solanke makes his run, the wingers know when he's going to make his run. Uh, whoever's playing the number 10, whether it's Madison, whoever else, they'll understand when to play the the, the you know the one-twos, etc. It, it'll come with time. I'm sure it will. But one thing I will just say that we were talking before is Ange has been saying since the beginning of last season, the issue was the front three. Mm-hmm. Not the defense. And I think yesterday's, and well, to be honest, all four games this season have highlighted that we still have to click in that final third. Agreed. I think continuing with what, from what Stu was saying, like another thing that I should, I think we need, need to, is a really important part of the wider context is that recruitment has gotten off a lot better and that the players that have come in since Andrew's arrival, um, you know, are really established and, and are, are befitting the level. I think you know, there is definitely conversation to have to be had on Johnson, but you know, Van de Ven has come from pretty much nowhere to being one of the best defenders in the league. He'd be coveted by any club in Europe, probably. And I think the frustrating thing for me is that when you look at Madison, who who came in, there's a couple of players who we sort of think the senior players are saying, about, OK, we've got younger players, Gray and Bergfeld, who didn't come on yesterday. I was really disappointed, especially Bergfeld didn't come on when Madison was really pretty impotent. It's Madison it was okay in the first couple of games, but he was obviously a poor run the second half of last season. And between him and Romero, who, you know, for the majority of the game is really good. I don't like the way he's so bloody slow all the time. He sort of struts out like a peacock and, you know, stamp with his foot in the ball. I'm sure there's probably a good reason for that, but it annoys me. But, you know, he is very, very good. And then he just switches off and he has cost us. Those moments have cost us in three games now out of four Mm -hmm. and that's incredibly frustrating so i mean these are things that are totally legitimate in my opinion um and let's focus on those specifics rather than just this carte blanche kind of you know massive criticism of an entire you know scenario we're still getting the the most boring narrative at the moment is same old problems so predictable what What yeah. are you talking about? End of last season, the issue was we couldn't defend set pieces because Vicario yeah, yeah, was getting yeah. pushed with the ball. We fixed that. Then the fullbacks were getting caught out, the wingbacks were getting caught out, and every counter we were just completely exposed and conceding. We fixed that. Now the issue is the front three out clicking. Everyone's like, same issues. It's, it's not the same yeah. issues. Yeah. We've fixed yeah. issue one and two, but we still have issue three. Yes, yeah. it still exists. But this blind sweeping, and doesn't know what he's doing, nothing's changing. It's just absolute bollocks. Yeah. But Eric says, God, sorry. I was just going to say one thing that obviously my, my Italian hat on has annoyed me that this season, the knives have been out for both Destiny and Vic. And Destiny's just come back from how long out? And yesterday, he was playing yeah, against one of the best yeah. wingers in the country. And he had a good mm. game, in my opinion. Mm. And, yeah. and Vic as well. He's pulled off a couple of great saves and. I mm-hmm. still don't think the goal was his fault. There was four people stood in front of him. How is he supposed to get that ball? Mm-hmm. And I just think, you know, guys, stop having to have a boo boy. Just get behind the team. They don't want to accept the reality that we're just probably the sixth or seventh best team in Arsenal or the second, and we lost. So they have to find a reason or someone to blame. Something that could be fixed with just one swoop in the transfer market instead of accepting it's going to take another two years. I think you say there, Jim, about being sixth or seventh, and maybe that's true. But I think, like, other than the top, definitely top two, whether Liverpool are really up there and above everybody in that pack that we belong to, below that, you know, with moments being a little bit different, and people can say ifs and buts, but I think it's it's fair to say with, with moments being a little bit different in the Newcastle game and the Leicester game, there's another five points there. And if we have nine points now and yesterday should have been a draw i mean okay i i know none of those things happened but if we get those points then the league table looks incredibly different the narrative around the whole thing is mm. like you know so far from where what we're actually what we have are having to respond to and that we're sort of responding to the noise that's out there and trying to sort of give a, a broader view on things but i don't really know Maybe it is. There's there's just that pack, isn't there? And we're in there with the Villas and the Chelsea's and Man, Man United and Newcastle. And there's it's going to be one of those te- teams that gets fourth and fifth. But, like, it's only game four. Honestly, just think, can we just get a... But also, yeah. Just wait and see what happens, for God's sake. We seem to be the other side of the coin to Newcastle, 
because we've probably deserved or yeah. could have won all four games. Yeah. They could have lost all four games, mm-hmm. and they've got 10 points from four games. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And you know Stu, who we had on, not you, Stu, the, on the Newcastle preview the other day, um, yeah. preview the Newcastle game. He said that to me. He, he said exactly, essentially, he just said to him, I mean, he watches all our games as well. He's got a bit of a soft spot for us and listens to the pod because he's a nice guy. But essentially what he said is, if it's weird, I think we should be where you are and you should be where I, we are. Like, we're playing terribly and getting through games mm. we shouldn't be getting through. Mm. Um, but he did say, to be faced, one of the differences he had is last season they had no bench because they had so many injuries. Mm. And this season they do have re- they made really good signs like Tenali is coming off the bench like what a player to bring off the bench mm. and those players can just do what kind of the Man United squad does just play crap but have someone so good they'll just whip in a goal from thirty yards or a ridiculous mm. cross and get bail you out but it doesn't last that people know it eventually catches up with you but so si, you've been so patient mate I don't know if you're just tired but <laughs> I got two so I'm going to give you two questions because one of them is more important than the other, but it'll be quick to answer. But N17 right. Stew says, what condiment do you like with your roast dinner? I like mint sauce, horseradish, mm. and red currant jelly. English mustard. With what beef? What meat? Beef? Anyway, beef? I, like me, I like English mustard with anything, mate. I love, yeah. Don't pull your face, Johnny. It's not your Johnny, question. Johnny, what do you like? Go oh, on, mate. You oh, it's your question now. It's your question now, is, is, now, is it? it? Well... Just... Beef and mustard every day of the week. Yeah, English mustard and beef. You guys I mean, I'll like, me. Don't get me wrong. I'll take an apple sauce with pork. I'm not saying I'm ruling yeah. the other condiments out. We're talking and about favourites. And your mint sauce for your lamb. No, I don't like yeah. mint Depends sauce. Depends on the meat. I don't like <laughs> mint sauce. Mint sauce and lamb. Pork. Controversial, yeah. You've got to love mint I'm, sauce. Well, You've got to love mint oh, sauce, yeah. yeah. Ross, come Beautiful. back me up, son. Come well, on. Come on, Ross, decide about No, I'm not going to back you up, sorry. It's oh, mint sauce with anything. Apple sauce with pork is fine. Mint yeah. sauce with the other everything. I don't like too watery mint sauce because sometimes you can yeah. pick it out and it's all swimming. Make it yeah. thicker. Are you a sauce or a jelly guy? Do you like mint jelly? Right, guys. Well, no. we got we got twenty minutes left to get through sixteen <laughs> questions, so we'll park the <laughs> mint sauce. But yeah, roast pork. What's, and, what's the uh, second question then? Jim seems I'm putting that one to good. bed. So actually, we kind of answered this one, but I'll read it out, Eric, um, and I'll give you another one. I love Andrew, but why are we shooting blanks against well-organized teams, defenses, and will Spurs start delivering serious artillery shells in tight circumstances? We're kind of touching it. Do you want to stick with that one, or do you want another one? Yeah, no, I, I, tell you, I, I think we, we touched on it, but Solanke's the key there. When you get a focal point in there that is gonna, you're going to work everything around, then he needs to bed in with the team, and they need to get used to it with the patterns of play, each other's, each other's runs, et cetera. But what we, we do have to get better at making those decisions in the final third. We need to be a bit braver, I think, at times for those final balls rather than stopping and cutting back. You know, we need to get round the back a little bit more. That's that's how you break down teams in a low block. You've got to get round their full backs and get the crosses in and the pull backs. And we just didn't do that yesterday. We weren't we were playing in front of Arsenal all the time and a team that wants to defend deep and narrow all day long for that team. All day long. Just James says. How do we feel about the goals we have conceded this season? Are we willing to accept there's been one contributing factor in all the goals, or is it a defensive lapse? Stu's nodding. Ross is kind of nodding. Anyone? Johnny's doing something. Someone give me an answer. (laughs) Go, Ross. Every goal is a defensive lapse. It's not as if you, you know, that's, it's too broad. I don't think there's been one specific problem, just that, I just, I, I, no, I, it's people, teams will concede goals. We're a very attacking, aggressive team. Um, and I, I don't even think Arsenal's front three played that well yesterday. I mean, even Jesus came on and he didn't look all that good. I don't think Saka particularly played well. And Martinelli was dreadful, but they got over the line. And in regards to our defence, it was fine. We just conceded from a, I mean, you called it, I think, Jim, anyway, before it happened. And you said they've come with a plan. They're going to get a set piece and try and score from it. And that's exactly what happened. What we've got to do is just be alert for that, for every single set piece. We can't just switch off, which I think somebody said Romero did. And I think he did a little bit. He was trying to complain to the ref that he got pushed. He had two hands on him, but I don't think it was big enough to do that. But Gary Neville's complaint about uh, Vicario. As somebody said, he had like four people in front of him. What's he supposed to do? Just pick them all up and toss them to the side. It doesn't work like that. So oh, I don't think there's some continuous theme running through the goals we conceded. It's just been we've switched off at the wrong places, going for a goal, and maybe we've conceded that way. 
I think the Romero piece around, you know, he, he got the push and Stuart, yeah, I conceded there was two hands there, there was a push. There's no way that, that Gabriel should be putting his hands on the number 17, on his numbers, on his back. He shouldn't be in front of him at that point. He needs to be okay. goal side and he needs to be making sure that he doesn't get that jump at the ball that, that he got. There's no way you should be seeing your number as a defender. You have to be goal side with him. I agree 100% with you. That's why I think he was alluding to Romero being the problem. Yeah. And he has been. Every single yeah. goal we've conceded, yeah, it was a, it was, he's played it was, a factor. It was a, it was a real lapse in, conversa in yeah, conversation. And, and I think he did two things wrong. One, he should never have been in front of him. I 100% agree. That's just 101 of defending. Two, when he got the push, of all the freaking Stop. South Americans Go in the down. world, down, the roll floor. on the freaking floor, and the referee yeah. has to make a call. Instead of just standing yeah. there like this, shrugging around like, dude, no. And you're supposed to be our vice captain. Have a look at yourself in the mirror. Totally. Mm -hmm. I'm agree. Yeah. I think there's, well, this, isn't, this episode is supposed to be a reasonable, you know, take on it. And we've got to accept some criticisms. Yeah. And some players get more protection than others. And Romero, it does feel like, has a bit of an ego thing going on at the moment where he's just not taking that yeah. role as passionately as he was. I don't know if it's, do you think it could be links to, he's been linked to Real Madrid and other clubs and we've seen this story before, right? Mm. Players, it goes to the head and then if they're, if they're stupid, they lose the interest from that club as well because they're not playing at their mm. potential and they go, oh, maybe they're not as good as I thought. But it, yeah. Um, other questions we had. Uh, so, so just, on... just, sorry, Jim, I'm just going to hop in because I think it, I was whinging before about matters, and I think it's there's a, there's a common thread to what you've just been saying there about Romero and him. These are two lads who are vice captains. They're big experience. Obviously, Romero's been very successful internationally, and they're supposed to be setting the example for our younger players. They're supposed to be the ones that we can depend on the most. But I think those two, anyone in our squad, and you know, starting team are really just letting us down too many times and their whole body language and their, sorry, I shouldn't curse, their facial expressions, they're just sending out really vibes with their whinging and they're like looking at the ref and moaning and rolling around and whip pissing around. It's just like, think of if we were all good enough to play football and pull on the cockerel in our shirt, how we would feel and what we would do would be, you know, and you see these Boys, doing that, it's just incredibly frustrating. And I, I'm really still quite, I'm quite cross because I think I definitely get in that vibe from Romero about his, it just seems to be kind of just really kind of cruising along. And like, it is a contradiction because he does go in, he made a brilliant tackle in the far corner from me up at the Paxton. Mm -hmm. I can't remember who he stopped. But, you know, he's a really good defender as well. It's just so frustrating because, yeah. Those mm. boys are really letting the side down, and that's where I'm. That's what makes me angry, and that's why I think that's those are the sorts of things that we should be calling out. And there's other things that I'm, maybe I don't agree with other fans, but these are the issues that actually, as Stu just said, the mistakes and the culpability of Romero actually is really, really significant in terms of our points tally, and that's what we should be focusing on things like that rather than just Ange being some kind of fraud who's out of his depth. End of rant. They're letting him down, those guys. Yeah, it's not him letting them down. Everybody. You hide it yeah. so well, Johnny. You keep your anger yeah. really... You're so you know, calm. Under, I did, didn't I? Under... Yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I try. We Good question here from Matt, guys. Um, I don't know, up to you guys you want to answer it. I think Rossi haven't had one in a while. Um, I'll give you this one. But uh, we are all... Matt at Nkuda says, we are all in agreement that we should be utilising more Anoda more. Can only imagine those two with Slanky through the middle is our move for the FA Cup and Europa League. It's hard because I thought Son got away with a little bit of criticism yesterday. He didn't. Yeah. He didn't do much throughout the game. I thought we missed Basuma. I just wanted to throw that in. It's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. been sitting there for about yep. twenty minutes, but I thought we missed Basuma yeah. as well. Anyway, but to go on to your point, Odebert, Yeah, he he's looking. He did look sharp, but then I always think subs will always look great. You always think. The player that's not playing becomes better mm. when the team is suffering anyway. Because um, all of a sudden, you know, players like Archie Gray and Bergvall are all great again and so and so. But I think, I think maybe I would love to see Odebert. Solanke needs another game, so play him against Coventry, I would. And 
on the right, maybe stick with Johnson, give him a confidence boost, say that we're backing him, and just let them go at Coventry and just see what happens. I think Son, he's not the same player, obviously, because he's 31, 32 now. We've got to accept the fact that he hasn't got the pace that he used to have. So I do think there needs to be a narrative around when does that, um, start to shift and we start playing him a little bit less and other people a bit more. Werner's obviously going to be an impact sub for us for the whole season. Get this lad who even company wanted to take to Bayern Munich. Let's see what he's like and give him a stretch of games. There's no point just dropping him for the odd one. Give him a stretch and give Sonny a bit of a kick up the arse and say, look, you've got to improve because his his output isn't great at the minute. No one's is, mm. by the way, but his has dipped a lot more. So I asked you, got you. No, I was just going to say, in, in my opinion, Odober should get a game. Mm. I think Johnson is an impact sub player. I'm not writing him off, but I think Odeberg deserves a chance because Johnson really hasn't stepped up. And to defend Son a bit, I saw a stat the other day of all the wingers on the pitch yesterday. He was the only one who successfully got past his men. And the actual mm -hmm. attempts at taking on players was ridiculously low. He had a four, I think, and the others had about maximum one each. Um, I think our, our wingers need to start being brave and actually start trying to take players on before, you know, that's how you create space is because yeah. you get past a man, someone else has to be brought out of position, creating space somewhere else, and then you get the cross in. I think it's also a little bit too early for more, but that's just my opinion. Like yeah, probably, think, go on, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, no, I think I think that's that's one of Odebert's strengths, right? He's running with the ball. He's got some pace. He can uh, he can, he can take the full back on. And I think uh, to Rossi's point, if we can give him a run, you have got Coventry, Brentford, at Carabag. Give him a run in those three games and see how he gets on. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. That's where that's the competition perfect for him. That's where we've got to give it a go. I think we're not going to see people will be like, oh, I really hope that we see a change against Brentford. But I think Andrew will be thinking, I'm sticking to what my senior players are for now. But if someone shines in the Europa League or the Carabao Cup for a couple of games consecutively, then I'm going to put them into the mm -hmm. first team. But So we're still going to be a few weeks away from that potentially happening. But there's a good question next, which kind of answered it, Coy's honey badger. But is our lack of production in the final third down to form, personnel, tactics, or all three? I know we're kind of touching this already, but... Anyone want to take that one? I think it's, for me, it's probably a mixture of the first two, the form and the personnel. Um, I think the, the personnel have got a gel. I think there's a bit of form to Ross's point. Sonny is not in the best of form at the moment. He's had, he's had one good game this season. And I think he's disappointed a little bit in the others. So I don't think it's tactics. I think it's the form of the individuals and the personnel. Be braver. Make those passes rather than cut. It just annoys me so much when they cut back and then, and then we just play it across the front of the box again and you haven't got that. You, Madison is supposed to be that player that can play those incisive little through balls and he's just not on his game at the moment. And I, don't, I wonder whether it's because there's a lack of competition for that position as well. I mean, who who else do you put in there right now? I mean... The, the argument is Decky, but he's, is he a 10 or he's more of that, that double eight pivot, isn't he? I mean, so I, I think Madison, there's a bit of complacency maybe, maybe slipped into his game. I think Stu mentioned that before, something about needing another 10. But uh, anyway, sorry, yeah. also. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so, so, so I'm not <laughs> sure it's the The other tactic. thing that Stu mentioned is, sorry, sorry the other thing no, that Stu mentioned is was about... Yesterday was with Solanke just coming back with that opportunity he had early on, and he took too many touches, and Gabriel snuffed him out, and you know took about really five too away. many touches, didn't he? You know, but but, the, but he's not when he's playing his thirty eight games in a row for Bournemouth, he's not doing that. He's just playing on instinct. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I think that's a big part of our problem. Has been a big part of problem in our four games so far this season that mm. our top striker who got injured in the first game is only just back for the fourth game and that's bound to have an effect mm. you know it's not the only issue but it's a big hopefully it's something that will be reconciled for the for the majority of the season and he stays fit the one thing i i will say that i was a bit disappointed in end yesterday that bergval wasn't brought on because totally. the whole point that we didn't bring in someone was because Gray and Bergvall had apparently impressed mm -hmm. so much in training and they were amazing in the preseason games. So yeah. they've shown they can do it. He's come out and said they've impressed. Madison has been poor. Bergvall deserves yeah. a shot. I mean, yeah. I do not understand why he's not giving them a role. Yeah. yeah. 
agree. Maybe that, maybe we don't know though. There's someone made a good point that maybe Ange, and you know the comments about winning a trophy. Like we know he's optimistic, but there's no way he's thinking I'm going to win the Premier League this season. Deep down, you know, he put a gun to his head. He's thinking I can win a trophy and have a better Premier League season than I did last year, but my opportunities in the cups. Some people are saying he's might be prioritizing one of those competitions more and saving someone like Bergvall. It might be Wednesday night in Coventry thinking, I want a few players that I actually think could be replacing the senior players rested for that game because it's just as important in his eyes. But anyway, it's just a theory. Matt Barker said, who lacks more bravery, the players or the fans? Well, the fans, <laughs> clearly. Ace of Spurs, how are you doing, guys? How long do you think it'll be till Ange brings success to the club? Season two. Season two. <laughs> he said it himself. Season two, but statistically season four, but it could be season two. Isn't it the third full season? Third full season, so yeah, yeah. Okay, next year. And I would also like to say, as a club, we've managed to break every other manager's, you know, always exactly. winning a cup somewhere. So yeah, that's why I think we'll break his, he always wins something in season two run, but it'll that's definitely fine. be season three. Jacka, if you were in charge, what would you do to address... No, I'm so, I know there's not a jacker on the call. Jacker says this. If you were on charge, what would you? If you're in charge, what would you do to address the lack of product in the final third? We think we've kind of discussed yeah. this. There's there's they just an element need time of time to yeah. gel. They just yeah. need time to gel. Exactly. Solanke, I think so, we've all said Solanke didn't have a pre-season, did he? He wasn't there. Yeah. So no, he's, he needs time. This is only his second game. And there was that moment at Newcastle, wasn't there? Johnson was down the right, and Sonny just stopped for some weird reason yeah. when the ball. Yeah, so that was and that was a great. I'm not having a go, him, by the way, it? yeah, I'm not having a go at Sonny. I love Son. He's, he's my heart and everything. <laughs> I just want him to be better. I yeah, it's, that'll just take time to gel. Mm. And there's a little bit of personnel there. I think we accept that. Like, we're not we're not going to win the league with a trinity of. Um, you know, Johnson, 32-year-old son, and Solanke alone without really good players challenging them, you know, with Werner as the backup and a young Odeberg right now. Like, I think there's we're assigning or two away, but that's fine. It's going to take two or three years of transfer windows to get there. Other areas are nice more to important. have Richie to come off the bench sometimes. Yeah, even things like that. Huge yeah. difference. Even Langston. Actually, I see when he comes on, he yeah. plays with belief and he makes an impact. When Werner comes off... He's just another body on the pitch. He's not far off Brian Heal, in my opinion, in terms of what the difference that he makes. God love poor mm. old Brian. I think Archie Gray, I would have liked Archie Gray to come on yesterday because he's a, he's a real energetic midfielder. I remember his game. Yeah. Do, you remember, do you ever seen him against Chelsea in the FA Cup and he was everywhere? I just thought he could breathe that yesterday. I, that's one of my gripes. Mm. But no. So after Jacker, we have Jack. He says, if you had to choose one, should our defence be doing more to protect Vicario and set pieces, or should we be demanding more from Vicario? Stu, this is a question for you, mate. Should Vicario be doing more, or should the defence be doing more to protect Vicario? I, I he's your boy. He's my boy, and I'll admit last season he was a bit weak. That said, any other goalkeeper gets the physical attention he got last season and it's a foul this season i've been watching him carefully and i think he's been a lot more forceful coming out but i will say that i thought dan me in the, in the whatsapp group made a good point that we need to stop putting when they put their player in front of him we need to stop crowding that player out with our defenders because it's just creating more and more bodies in front of vicario that he can't get through so it might be something for, for them to look at. David Bristol says, where art thou Romero three times in three games? Essence of tragedy. I think we discussed this yeah, one, yeah. but it's a fair point. As Johnny says, here, here. Simon, who is at McScooby. What's your favorite episode of The Simpsons? Ross, I think asking what your favorite episode of The Simpsons is logically starts with you. <laughs> Probably one of your fans. Yeah. Um, it's Homer. It's Homer's barbershop quartet, and any other answer, come and fight me. Anyone want to dispute that? I like Lulla Palooza. What was that say? Lulla Palooza is that where he he's getting shot in the stomach with the cannon. That has the best joke in it, you know. I'm um, was it the least? I'm Billy. I'm from Smashing Pumpkins. I'm Homer Simpson smiling politely. It's still my favourite <laughs> joke. But... <laughs> You can see why I do the do the account, but yeah, like cyclopedic bit now. I like the one where he gets obese to get free burgers. That's a good one as well. So Noah, can we get a set piece coach? Coach Noah, I think we we've have, got one. We've, we we, have, we're doing a lot name, better in the area. 
Gone. His Sorry. name is Nick Montgomery. He's coming as a, uh, a a junior coach, but with a focus. It's not an out and out set piece coach, but he's focus. Part of his job is to focus on attacking and defensive set pieces. When did that happen, Sai? Uh, I saw it a couple of days ago. I think he signed. He, he, I think just before the first, uh, just before the first game. So it was part of the. There were two of them coming. Him and somebody else. Um, and that's when we upgraded, who was it, to the first team set up? I can't remember the names, but we've definitely got one. This guy, Nick Montgomery, is looking at it. There you go. That, that's a key. He was Hips. He was Hips manager, wasn't he? He was, yes. Yeah. I, saw I think he's earlier... a, is he Australian. Sorry, Stu. Yeah. No, no worries. Not, not sure, Johnny, but yeah, I just yeah. saw, saw when, when I saw the question, I thought, I thought I'd heard it somewhere, so I had a little bit of a scoot around and yeah. So uh, I know Jim has, has gone on about this uh, previously about how important set pieces are, and Ben posted in the in the group earlier this evening that how good Arsenal are and how you know we hopefully this coach gets us there because they've conceded one goal this season, twenty nine and thirty eight, and they've scored twenty two set piece goals last season. Mad. That is yeah. that is. So they've got like a Gareth Bale amount of goals in his best yeah. ever season at Spurs just yeah. from corners. Yeah. yeah, it's mad. Um, the fire in the eyes. Why does our offense suck? Well, a bit over that one. We'll we'll leave you leave you with your rage. Come back next time with a more constructive <laughs> Come back but with just a little that's ember a... in the eyes, not the <laughs> fire. Little, your good name for that. We're all hurting, mate. It's okay. Um, a little cuddle for you. Um, Paul Gallagher. Should we have kept Troy Parrott instead of buying Solonki? <laughs> no. Oh my God. <laughs> no. <laughs> Is Paul? that a satire, yes? Uh, well, he, he said Solonki, so I think he's just having us on. But yeah. fair play with you are, mate. Um, yeah, but Troy Parrott did have a very, very good game. He got four goals, didn't he? So mm. Wasn't it against um, Van Persie's team, which made it funnier? Because uh, it was like Van it's, per- yeah. one of Van Persie's yeah. first games in management. He got hammered like seven. Yeah, yeah. Nice. <laughs> Is it pundits on Sky Sports adding to fans' impatience nowadays? This from Callum Phillips. I don't remember wanting the likes of Yole or Hoddlesax when I was a kid. The pundits speak as if Postagoglu should have built a title challenging side. He is three quarters years and seven, three or four years behind Arteta and 700 million behind him too. Yeah, I think that says it all, doesn't it? I think it says it all, yeah. It's madness, mate. It's, It's adults who can't comprehend their emotions and anger at a situation. And the easiest solution is to go blame the guy who picks the team and get them out and get another one. It's also a different era now, isn't it? I mean, they just yeah. want, they need hits. They need the, um, oh, what's the word called? When... Sound bites. Sound bites, yeah. that's the one. Yeah. So, yeah. That's We've all... all got a narrative. Around... Yeah, go on, Johnny. So it's, it's the thing. It's all about, all about clicks and all about followers and all this kind of yeah, nonsense. Yeah. I'm sorry. You, you look at a presidential debate, and maybe we're not supposed to be politics, right? But you've got a dude saying we, they're eating dogs and cats. And you can edit this out if you want. But that's the world we're living in now. And this guy could be, for yeah. the second time, the most powerful man in the world. So, you know, I think once you take that as the reality, then... Yeah. This, I mean, that's don't do that is, politics, Johnny. But sorry, I'm the sorry, point. but, but that is what it's point. all about now, isn't it? It's, it's all yeah. about the subscribes. And likes, but I get what it? you're saying. At, like, at Jim Oso Spurs. Yeah, at Jim Oso Spurs. Should we answer it? <laughs> uh, yeah. And don't forget, we've got memberships now for as little as one ninety nine a month. So, um, but <laughs> no, I get your point. Like, no, but let's just note, like, regardless of your views and politics and stuff, a politician yeah. equally knows that they'll get traction saying things like that. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's going to no get reactions. It's going to get media articles. Yeah. There's no such thing as bad publicity. Yeah, exactly. So, Phil two six five. Do you think we should have signed Ivan Tony this summer? No, no. No. Does anyone know how he started in set? Does anyone know how he? Started? I, think I don't he think he grew cares. In Ronaldo's team. Great. <laughs> to in be front fair, of how though. many people? <laughs> yeah. Hold on. Yeah. Hamill. <laughs> Yeah. Was it 400k a week tax free and he was on 30k a week taxed at 40% no. before? Yeah. So he's had one That's game. Good. Fair play to him. Not... But I, I would like to say if he'd have played for us, what else would he have done? Because the problem is not missing the chances, the problem yeah. is creating the chances. Yeah. Well, I have to say, for if you, he actually wasn't a great goal scorer, he was a better player at linking up play, wasn't he? 
So I kind of think like maybe amongst, I know we don't actually wish we'd signed him, but I reckon it, I'd way rather him than Rich Arlison. So oh, yeah. Where that long story round. But would I rather him than Slanky? No, definitely not. No. But Rich Allison, yes. I'd have loved... If we had chelsea Basie type owners, I think we'd have probably just signed both. We'd have been like, Bosch, Solanke, Bosch, I, Tony. I still think if Rich Allison had accepted the Saudi offer, we'd have got Tony as well as Solanke. But then Tony would have been looking saying, I'm 30, I've got 100k a week on the table from Spurs. I lose half of that to the tax man or 400k from Saudi. Actually, no, because they would have got Rich Allison instead. So. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. That was it, boys. Any yeah, other got final... through the lot. Got through the lot. Uh, if you uh, don't mind making sure that you give us a rating, if you listen on the audio podcast as well, um, that massively helps us out because the way the algorithm works is it yeah. puts podcasts with more five-star reviews in front of other people. And uh, yeah, also make sure you follow us on social media and that, YouTube or Twitter, so we can get your questions and read them out on shows like this. Like and subscribe. If this ain't five star, I don't know what is, Jim. Do you know right. what I, mean? I don't know. Can I Jesus. just say something? Because we've, we've got a game in two days' time and we've got Brentford in whatever, five days' time. And given the reaction to what happened yesterday, and I, I don't want to like be putting on a, da- a dampener thing. I'm, I'm being preemptive here. And, and maybe oh, this is God, my just Charlie. like long-standing what? Spurs <sighs> fandom. So Coventry City got to the semi-finals of the FA Cup and they only lost in penalties to Manchester United. Mm-hmm. And Brentford went to the Etihad at the weekend and they only lost by two goals to one. So it isn't beyond any realm of like possibility that we go down both of those teams. I don't think we will, but I didn't think we would lose yesterday either because I generally predict Tottenham wins. But I'm just saying this because... We've got this reaction to yes to what happened yesterday, like when we played a really really top top team, and people kind of think, well, it's Arsenal, and they're a really top team. If it happened against Coventry, can we please remember that actually, you know, aren't a joke? I know they're struggling a bit in the in well, the championship at the once. moment. They've only had one win. This they've season, won one, so and drawn two, and lost two. So they're not having yeah. a great start to the season either. I, I'm, I'm not following it. But my point, I'm just, I'm saying this, I'm not going, to, if you ask me if we lose to Coventry and we lose to Brentford, given, depending on what happens in those games, I guess, I'm not going to be turning around next Monday and saying anything different from what I'm saying now. Not because I'm an idiot and because I'm blind, because but because everything that I said earlier about Arteta still is still valid because these things don't you you're not going to have a nice incline of a gradient that's steady you're going to have knocks ups and downs it's going to be disappointments along the way and there'll be some amazing moments along the way and let's hope that we've got amazing moments in both of those games but let's just be real because there aren't too many games now where you can just turn up and spank the opposition like unless we're getting Everton every week um you know then it's not going to be it's not going to be a, like a bed of roses so like that, I do. I think it's important to say that because I, I just, it might happen. You know, it really might happen. And, and I got, I dread to think. I, I mean, I don't go on X Twitter anymore. I don't look at it because the the WhatsApp groups are bad enough, and that's not easy at the moment either. So sorry, I don't mean to be putting a downer on no, things. But... No, I agree. There's, there's. God, sorry, Stu, you going to say something? There's, there's always the old expression of, um, like my old thing of, if you want to see what progress and growth looks like that's what you think it looks like you think it's a straight line going you know up in a diagonal upwards trajectory across a graph to show growth but the reality is it's more like if you um, were looking to look at the nasdaq or like any big like consistently growing stock like that like that is what a, Ooh, what progress what looks like if you can see that on, my, on the screen right now it's like mm-hmm. It goes up a bit, yay, 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 down, up, 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 down, up, 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 down, up, down, up, 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 up. But who has ever taken over a club and it's just been like straight up. Even by Leverkusen now, right? They've gone straight up and they're not going to finish first this year by the look of it. So does that mean Alonso should get sacked and he's rubbish because he isn't taking them forward to the next level? It's like, no, he just had a higher rise. He'll have a drop and he'll come back up again. But uh, yeah. So at Jim Oso Spurs. <laughs> like and subscribe, people. Like and subscribe. <laughs> didn't win in season Jim one either, Jim... by the way. 
It doesn't exist otherwise. No, got to live in my. Yeah. Anyway, up the Spurs, boys. Roll Come on, on Coventry. You Spurs. Will we do yeah, a watch along? We're going to do a watch along, boys. We're going to do a watch along for Coventry. Yeah, sure. Put it on the internet. Right. Why not? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Jump it's good. Nude, no, nude watch along. There you I had it here first. Again. Oh, no. Every Everyone time we signed up and then it went nude. Every time, <laughs> every time we score, Johnny will take this a piece of clothing edited, off. Right? Yeah. No. Every time we I score, Johnny will take a piece of clothing off. <laughs> All right, up the Spurs, boys. Yeah, Go Spurs. Spurs. <laughs>